First of all, thank you very much. It's a pleasure being here uh, to talk about uh, social ontology and to talk uh, after Erika, which uh, I think gave um, um, an interesting um, uh, thought about uh, about uh, a particular, very special way of, of using uh, um, metaphysics in order to to offer uh, a way in social ontology. Um, now, I want to do just two or three th things um, during my presentation. Uh, first of all, I want to introduce in, in a little bit more um, um, articulated way what social ontology is, just for, for the students. Um, then I would try to, um, I try to explain a particular kind of social action uh, that can be used in social ontology in order to do something, which I will try to explain uh, in the second part of the presentation. And then I will try to, um, to, to, to offer some conclusion. So uh, what about social ontology? Um, as a, uh, Erika mentioned before, social ontology is that part of contemporary philosophy. The tradition is very short because, uh, as you probably know, uh, mostly the analytical philosophy try to make uh, uh, more systematic uh, uh, reflection about social reality. So uh, it's a part of contemporary philosophy that investigates um, the domain of social reality. Just an example of what are the um, elements that, uh, uh, about which social, uh, on, uh, social philosophers try to reflect. Uh, uh, the, you can you can see uh, some of these uh, of these uh, questions. What are the constitutive rule of social uh, uh, reality? What are its objects? How can we describe the basic relation uh, between its constituent element or constitutive elements? In what way and how much does social reality depends on the subjects? Um, or on the ob objects, which groups are relevant for consideration of social reality? How are new technology changing the structure of social reality? And so on and so forth. Um, just to mention some uh, scholars which are important in this tradition. Um, I mentioned uh, three of them, uh, and I choose these, these guys because um, they are very different in the approach. Um, the first one is Maurizio Ferrari. Uh, Maurizio was supposed to be here, so I don't, uh, uh, I, I, I don't my, the, in the program, I, I, I will not try to go in the detail of his, uh, of his thought, but I, I can add something. Uh, but in a nutshell, uh, Maurizio tried to develop a social ontology based on the concept of uh, inscribed act uh, and about uh, the notion of trace. Maurizio's social ontology uh, envisaged the idea that documents are produced by generative acts and that these documents are what social reality uh, is articulated around. So first of all, we, in order to explain social, social reality, first of all, we have to use the documents and we have to construct a sort of genealogy about the notion of documents. So not the subjects, but the documents, objects. Uh, on another side, we have Margaret Gilbert. Gilbert is um, uh, a prominent scholar in the, uh, she's an American, um, a prominent scholar in, in, in this field. Um, and she reflects above all, above all on cooperative social action. So on person and on the way in which person usually uh, construct or act in particular circumstances. So describing cooperative social action uh, that imply a particular strong bond between the actors collaborating in the action. The idea of Gilbert is that uh, if we are able to explain the way in which people usually act in their, in their daily lives, uh, this is a, a good strategy, a good instrument in order to explain the more complex part of uh, um, social reality. Gilbert uh, speaks uh, about plural subjects. Um, this is a sort of uh, 
emergence entity in, in, uh, in uh, if we want to, to uh, use the Erika um, way of understanding the uh, social reality and the commitment that it is established between them and certain, uh, under certain condition. Um, we will enter a little bit in this, uh, um, in this topic. And finally, as you know, we have John Searle who develops a social ontology around the so-called constitutive rule of social reality. So in order to explain how social reality works, we have to uh, put on the table the, um, the basic rule we human beings adopt in order to um, organize uh, the social world. Um, who develops his social ontology around the so-called constitutive rule of social reality and the concept of collective intentionality, which is, as you know, probably very, very problematic. Um, so, social reality is the result of construction between people. This is true at least for Gilbert and Searle, not for Maurizio Ferraris. And the basic rule of, uh, uh, of, of this way of constructing reality is the following, uh, x count uh, x uh, y in C. Uh, a piece of paper, that those are examples, a piece of paper becomes a dollar bill. Uh, a piece of paper count as money uh, in a certain context in C, for example, in the uh, in the US, a urinal became, became a work of art, a wall became a border. The idea is that something becomes something else in a particular context every time people decide to transform that things in another things. In order uh, to do this transformation, in order this transformation be possible, serve puts on the table some condition, a context, for example, US, uh, recognized by people, uh, and this is the reason why collective intentionality um, plays a fundamental role in this context. So collective intentionality as, uh, as a biological precondition of sharing attitude, attitudes and idea. And is, uh, uh, if you put the attention of the, on the idea of biological precondition, it's easy to understand why this notion is deeply problematic in Sir, because um, it's a sort of uh, hypothetical hy hypothesis, is a sort of hyper hypothesis uh, that uh, neuroscientists, for example, have to, uh, have to um, to prove. Uh, if uh, collective intentionality, for example, doesn't exist, all uh, the construction by Searle uh, can become very problematic. And finally, rules, the constitutive and the regulative one, which are the rules that uh, um, are presupposed in the uh, framework adopted by Searle. Uh, I think that that's very, very famous, obviously. And this kind of approach can be used and was used by philosophers of art in order to explain why you can consider that uh, piece of, uh, that ordinary object, I would say, as a work of art. A material object can be transformed into a work of art without altering any material properties of the objects. As in this case, apply, as in the case of the urinal uh, made by Duchamp, apply the constitutive rule. We have um, the urinal counts as a work of art in a certain context, which means uh, in the uh, world, in the art world of the uh, 20th century. So. Um, in the context of Gilbert's framework, uh, we have uh, uh, again the centrality of the person in order to construct and understand social reality, uh, but uh, Gilbert shifts the attention from the rule to the action, I would say. 
Such a reality depends on the subjects and in particular on the form of their social relations. So in order to understand social reality, uh, it's very important to understand the dynamics of uh, relation between persons. It will be interesting then to investigate the, statu the status of social action. Um, Gilbert provides an ontology especially devoted to the understanding actors of the social reality better, and especially the way of acting together in very uh, basic uh, and easy situation. The main pillars of Gilbert ontology uh, are many, but the, probably the, more import the most important uh, are the notion of plural subjects, which is a sort of emergence entity um, which uh, that we, we can introduce in our ontology when uh, two or more subjects uh, um, act together in a very particular uh, framework. Um, the promise, because without the, um, the function of the promise in the social world, uh, um, the social reality would be uh, possible in, uh, in Gilbert framework. So this means that promise are, are sort of uh, peculiar objects. Uh, and the bonds between subjects uh, uh, in the social act action, be because in particular social action, especially <coughs> in those social action in which, in which two or more people make promise together, um, for Gilbert, in the Gilbert framework, we have uh, um, we, we find particular uh, bounds between person. And this, this bound is, is called joint commitment by, uh, by Gilbert. And then we have Maurizio Ferraris, which, uh, uh, who introduced a, a completely different perspective because in order to explain uh, how such a world uh, works, um, as I told you, uh, he used the notion of um, um, documents and of recorder um, acts. In this framework, it is inscription of the documents, the way in which the document is, is, is made, uh, the medium that makes social objects possible. Regardless of uh, uh, which perspective, perspective we decide to follow between the three, those three very different philosophers, one of the points that emerges from the philosophy of these three guys, even though that they are so different, is the centrality of action for understanding social reality. Um, Maurizio uh, thinks that uh, it's social reality um, is something that uh, comes from documents and from the use of documents. Um, Margaret Gilbert thinks that uh, very easy, a simple action like uh, walking together uh, can offer the very basic uh, idea in order to explain very complex uh, um, system like social um, reality and the same uh, using different notion obviously uh, is for John Searle. What I would like to do now is to take a closer look at the issue of social action. I will offer another kind between the different kind of social action which are uh, discussed by social ontologists by paying particular attention to the problem of diachronicity. I mean, uh, most important uh, um, political philosophy of the modern era um, try to explain the way in which uh, so sociality works using um, and debating about the idea of diachronicity, how it's possible that a society lasts over time. Um, my point is that uh, now it's necessary for a, a lot of reason to, to think about uh, um, a more long diachronicity, and so we have to include another kind of action in order to explain this problem. Okay, um, I, I will, um, not, not only me, but uh, the scholar who tried to investigate this kind of problem, uh, um, 
talk about uh, transgenerationality or intergenerationality in order to um, discuss how it's possible that uh, society lasts uh, long in time. To explain the metaphysical and, and ontological principle underlying the theorization, and that is what uh, I try to, uh, to do with, uh, with you in the second part of the presentation. Um, the philosophy of transgenerationality uh, need to indicate and develop a philosophical anthropology of reference in order to construct that, this kind of vision. Uh, it's important to indicate and develop a practical areas of application of this kind of uh, uh, particular agency, I would say. And finally, to indicate a direction of action for future and uh, uh, human history. Um, this is a sort of program, and on this program I'm actually working, but with you today I just to try to say something about the first point. I, I will try to say something about metaphysical and ontological principle uh, underlying a theorization uh, about transgenerationality. So what is transgenerationality and how we can define uh, this notion? Uh, it's a notion that, as I told you, uh, deals with the agency, and I try to explain why. Uh, to explain the fact that uh, society endure over time, uh, I propose that social ontology and social philosophy include the concept of transgenerationality among their tools of analysis. This will allow the transgenerational question, so how is possible to that different uh, generation cooperate uh, during time, to be considered from a fun foundational and not just a moral perspective, as uh, is often the case. I propose to consider transgenerationality as a constraint. You, uh, as I mentioned before, also, Margaret Gilbert underlined the importance of uh, constraint between person when uh, we have to, um, to investigate social reality. So this is a different constraint be because it's a constraint between person who live um, in different part of time, not overlapping, what say. So I propose to consider transgenerationality as a constraint that manifests itself uh, in a different form in both the natural and social sphere, and that emerges in a particular type of action that uh, uh, I will describe as a transgenerational social action. So the first part of the program uh, deals with metaphysics, so uh, I will try to explain some uh, introductory idea. As a first step, I intend to present a series of principles that will enable the theoretical foundation of transgenerationality to be laid. Um, this is the first principle. Being exist in most uh, circumstances is uh, preferable to non-being. Uh, the principle is obviously not neutral from the metaphysical point of view. Uh, and concerns metaphysics. In fact, there is a large body of literature, even uh, rich and recent literature, which argues that non-being is preferable to being. However, it starts from a, a realist observation, life exists, and the idea uh, that is necessary to implement the condition that serve to preserve it. So that's obviously uh, uh, a precise point of view and a precise starting point that can be uh, made object of discussion. Otherwise, otherwise, if, there, uh, if this were not done, human beings would find themselves living in progressively worse condition and the degree of suffering to which they are subjected would uh, increase. So the starting point uh, in order to make 
to offer a foundation to this kind of perspective uh, um, is the um, observation about the value of being, I would say. Second principle, human species recognize the existence of the transgenerational bond, which means that we recognize in a way or, or another the fact that uh, there is a link from the natural and uh, social perspective between a person who lives in very, very, very different part of time. Um, human species recognize the existence of the transgenerational bond. This bond is biological, and our um, law system, for example, tend to protect this kind of, this type of biological link. Um, is biological in nature and takes on a social structure. So it's the same bond which has two different uh, nature, I would say. Its recognition supports the progress of the species. This is also true. Um, you, can, you can go with, with your mind to Kant, for example, and his political thoughts, and you can find a version of this, okay? The second principle concerns ontology, which means how reality, um, how reality exists and how reality is classified, and attest to the existence of bond uh, and the existence of a bond of biological nature between individuals of the same species that emerge in the traditional family context where by traditional context we mean the union of male and female that in the case we are uh, interested in give rise to procreation. This is the first step, obviously. On the other hand, in non-traditional family context, extended, homogeneous or adoptive families, it may be either biological or social, as in the case of families that express parenthood throat adaptation. So my first principle was uh, metaphysical principles, this is ontological in nature. The transgenerational bond can be observed uh, uh, above all in the circumstances in which it breaks down, giving rise to the phenomenon uh, known and studied by, I would say, by psychologists known as the replacement child. The child who replaces a sibling who has died prematurely and whose present absence uh, an experience illustrated by, between others, Van Gogh, Dali, Jacques Derrida, uh, bears a clear trace in the um, psyche. The transgenerational bond is structured as a caring relationship within the parent-child relationship and takes one more complex configuration of a clearly social type in long-term relationship. It should be noted, in fact, that human species has been able to create and make more complex the dynamics that emerge in family sphere by transposing the outside, by transposing them outside the restricted nucleus of the family to make them central pivots of social life. Um, I have called this uh, third principle uh, as rule of time because the, my tentative is uh, using um, a particular kind of action. We are, uh, I, I will explain this kind of action in a moment in order to make sense or to, um, to explain the fact that uh, society can uh, endure uh, over the time a lot. So the, the, the rule of time here uh, play a basic, a basic, uh, um, a basic rule. Um, in the philosophy of transgenerationality, the rule of time is important. According to this rule, time is, I would say, superior to space, or the importance of times is superior to space in order to explain such a reality. 
Perceived time, considered from a phenomenological perspective, is of two types. It can be short term or medium to long term. Human emotions are predominantly aimed at um, uh, enhancing survival, so they are addressed to a short term temporality. However, some emotions are aimed at the survival of the species and the satisfaction, satisfaction of need in the social spheres. In this case, they refer to a medium and long-term temporality. So as animals, I would say, our primary temporal dimension is the, is the short-term one. As social beings, um, which, which, which imply a more complex idea, the medium and long temporality uh, is more important in order to explain a lot of things. Therefore, of the, of the three temporal dim dimension, past, present, and future, the future must be, must be understood as the final cause. The future is a necessary condition for transgenerational action. Without the idea of future, it is impossible to understand how, uh, how the fact of human collaboration can be an option. Transgenerational action cannot be perfor performed outside the long-term uh, horizon, for example, in the, a situation of the absence of future. Uh, so humans are generally willing to engage in transgenerational behavior. We have, this is my idea, sort, we have a sort of natural predisposition in order to make possible cooperation with other humans during the time. And timely, I believe that the choice to favor transgenerational action, uh, action between authors and between agents that are um, posed in different uh, um, period of time. Uh, and I believe that the choice to favor transgenerational action and behavior is a competitive advantage for human species, which use transgenerationality, this kind of link, in much more conscious, structure, and sy systematic way than other animal species generally do. Example of whisper transgenerational practice within our species include education, we pass over and over um, cognition and other stuff between generations, development of human, humanistic and scientific knowledge, development of social and political institution, and so on and so forth. All these are techniques, I would say, um, that make possible to pass knowledge and other stuff between generation and also to make possible a positive collaboration between uh, um, different generations. It follows that the more we succeed in reinforcing those social structures that are inherently transgenerational, collaborative in this way, and the more we succeed in fostering behavior that is centered on transgenerational logic, the more we will favor the evolution of human species in the pursuit of greater intergenerational justice. Because that of intergenerational justice, as you can imagine, is one of the most problematic um, issue uh, of contemporary um, Western society. So what about uh, the structure of the action which I have tried to introduce uh, in the first part of the presentation. Um, transgenerational social action if, have the characteristic of requiring, and that's important, necessary cooperation between at least two generations. One of the two decide to carry out the action the first uh, group of agents that has a transgenerational 
character, while the second group is charged with continuing and possible concluding the transgenerational action. So you, you can describe this long action as an, as an action or as a, uh, as a set of singular action that can be described with a, a unique label uh, as an action made by two or more group of person. The first group is the group who decide who have the responsibility to begin the action and the other group of person is involved in this structure um, without, without uh, um, the possibility of uh, expressing the content, the consent to the action, okay? Uh, the central theoretical point of transgenerational social action lie, lies in the fact that the succeeding generation or succeeding group of person that complete the, transgeneration, the transgenerational action generally do not have the opportunity to give prior consent to the action. Only the first group decide. The critical point of transgenerational social action is that generation deciding on transgenerational action cannot require others. It's a mere impossibility because the others live uh, after a long time. In most cases, future generation, uh, for future generation I mean here the unborn, to agree to the action. Material impossibility, however, does not exclude the form of an ethical point of view. Uh, this type of action, if undertaken, should not include the adoption of special precaution towards future generation. This is the critical point, because future generation are not required to the concept. But in most of the cases, they must enter in the um, circle, I would say, or in, in the dynamic of the social action because this is a request by the action itself. So this is a tentative definition. Transgenerational action are those actions that require a necessary cooperation between two or more different uh, generation, one of which is a future generation, to complete the action. In other words, without future generation, it would be impossible to pay our public debt. Okay? Uh, in a point of history, we decide to, um, to take this debt for a lot of reasons, good or worse, this is not my point. And we know that someone at some point in the history is obliged to enter in this action, that of repaying the debt. Transgenerational action be directed toward the future and the past. Um, when directly to the past, they refer to entities such as ancestors, because obviously we can um, cooperate in some sense also with our ancestors. Someone who existed and no longer exists, when directed to the future, they refer to future generation, as I mentioned now. The young or the unborn. Um, these two type of entity from the metaphysical point of view uh, are very interesting, obviously, because the second one is a, is, ma is a sort of fictional entity. The unborn is something which uh, do not have uh, um, an existence in, spice, in space and time. So it's very difficult to, to, to say something about the right, for example, of future generation exactly for this, for this reason. Since the notion of transgenerational social action refer in many circumstances to the concept of future generation, it is necessary to make an ontological commitment to determine the type of entity we are talking about when referring to generation past and future. Past and future generation are, are a sort of a regulatory ideas of reason, okay? especially the idea of future generation, I would say. In particular, the notion of ancestor depends weakly on the subject constructing it, because when, a, from an historical point of view, we mention our ancestor, obviously we are reconstructing 
using obviously historical data, this idea. So they depend weakly from the subjects because we have an external world full of details that can allow this sort of reconstruction. Whereas the notion of future generation depends weakly on history because they didn't never exist and strongly on the subjects constructing it of, on our imagination, for example. We therefore examine in particular the concept of future generation in the sense that it's include the unborn. This is uh, um, obviously uh, much more interesting from the philosophical perspective because in this case we are talking about a, a non-existing being. In particular, future generations are entities that will exist soon or later, probably. This means that they have the characteristic of moving from the power to the act, from the potentiality to the actuality. In this sense, future generations are mainly character, characterized by one singular property. They have a, a uh, they have a possible being, they can exist, they are sort of possibilia. As such, they can be used a normative concept, regulative concept, as I mentioned, of our action. This possibility is guaranteed by the fact that uh, being is, and as uh, Arendt rightly noted, is perpetuated throughout birth. My idea is that we have introduced this kind of entity uh, which means future generation, into social reality more or less clearly, precisely in order to exploit this shift from power to um, action. The expectation is created that future generation will enter into the dynamic of transgenerational action. We expect that future generation will cooperate with uh, contemporary agents by continuing the action and, in most of the cases, by concluding the action, not changing the idea of those who decide the social action. As uh, uh, to remain in the, in the example of the day, the, 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 the debt, the future generation may repay the debt, our request of repaying that debt. In other words, psychological mechanisms are set in motion at social level using trust as an instrument to regulate social di di dynamics. I trust in future generation, I trust in the existence of future generation, and more, moreover, I trust in the fact that future generation will enter consciously in this sort of dynamics. An example of this use of the concept of future generation is the Article 9 of the Italian Constitution. By the way, this article was recently uh, changed and it's not so common to change an, uh, uh, an article of, of the Constitution. The Republic promotes, uh, I'm quoting, the Republic promotes the development of culture and scientific and technical research. It protects the landscape and the historical and artistic heritage of the nation. It protects the environment, biodiversity, and ecosystem, also in the interest of future generations. So, as you see, this is a sort of uh, fictional entities, as I told you, which, can, which is introduced in our legal system, and which is supposed to be um, activated, I would say, it, in certain particular circumstances. In certain particular circumstances, future generation um, acquire some rights. Generally, the attitude toward future generation is of this kind. In some circumstances, we shift onto future generation border of, or of decision or action that should be taken in the present. This is the case, for example, of action concerning the commitment and the mitigation of climate crisis. In other circumstances, we commit future generations to action that bid them to the, to the decisions of previous generations. This is the case, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, of the public debt of states. 
In both circumstances, what happens is that we privilege the needs of the present. Um, it is understandable for a lot of reasons that I have no time to explain here, but there are reasons for, uh, for our present to presentism, I would say. Rather than taking care of situations that are more articulated and complex, involving also future generation, like, for example, climate change. Um, in particular, this happens in the case of circumstances in which we oblige future generations to carry out action that derive from decisions made by those who precede them. From a moral perspective, however, the joint commitment to transgenerational action through recourse of future generation means the agents of transgenerational action to the joint goal of transgenerational action and to foster conditions that provide for the possibility of future generation to exist, according to our first principle, that of the prevalence of the being or over that not being. I will escape. This is a, a, an interesting um, historical example. I will not enter in this, but you can uh, do by yourself uh, the um, correspondence between Jefferson and Madison exactly about uh, this point uh, uh, because the two guys were discussing in the period of the uh, during the time of the writing of the American Constitution about uh, the way of which making collaboration between different generations more effective. It's an historical document so you can go by yourself. How many minutes? One, two, three? Three, okay. <laughs> um, in this context, the idea of promise, which is the same idea that Margaret Gilbert uh, uses as a very basic, as a very basic instrument in order to explain such a reality, um, play a specific, um, a, a specific uh, uh, role. As uh, Adolf Reinach effectively notes in the a priori foundation of civil law, when we contract a debt, the partner is as follows. A subject promises something to another subject. If the promise is properly formulated, which means in, the characteristic, uh, uh, in that characteristic uh, format uh, um, as both uh, uh, Reinach, but also Nietzsche, in order to, Nietzsche in the guy says, uh, says something like this, and Margaret Gilbert um, tried to explain. It brings into being an obligation and a claim. The obligation to repay the debt and the claim that one, and the claim of the one to whom we must repay the debt. The partner, the partner, of, the partner of transgenerational action implies that the one who incurs the debt and the one who must re re repay the debt are not the same entity. This is why the two group of person, two entities in my words, are placed in different uh, period of time, living in different periods of time. Nevertheless, obligation and claims, this is the point, remain valid. If this were not the case, as Madison, Madison uh, noted, it would be impossible to live in articulate social communities without promises, social uh, reality would be, wouldn't be possible, that have a longer lifespan than a single individual. Okay, just a few words in order to reach the conclusion. Um, as I told you, my hypothesis is that uh, the question of the achronicity is becoming much more relevant in contemporary society because we now have to face problems like climate crisis uh, or public debt or sustainability of wealth, uh, welfare system for which temporality plays a very important role. So in order to became much more um, able to explain all of this, we, we have to shift our perspective. 
What the philosophy of transnationality must then ask is how this is possible. That is, how we can sustain such a position. To formulate an answer, which I will not articulate here, however, I think it is useful to refer to the concept of war and future humanity. So we have the ability to uh, act in a transgenerational way to make cooperation between um, human beings who live in different periods of time in a very systematic uh, way. We have this ability and we have, uh, or we have tried at least in my perspective, to enforce this ability. Um, so we have to understand this specific structure of social action, which are cooperative action, but of a particular kind of cooperation. Um, we have to take some ontological commitment about the notion of future generation, also with the ancient, but it's not so relevant from, the, um, from a philosophical perspective. And we have also to introduce the notion of war in the uh, in a, in a, in a sense which is very close to that which was introduced by Anne Arendt. Um, in, in, in her most famous uh, uh, works. To say in a brief uh, what would take the space of an entire talk, we can say the following. The world is a semantic, historical, and value context that form the backdrop to all transgenerational action. They find the context, meaning, and other direction in that world. They have an impact on this world because Acting in a transgenerational uh, way, we transform our society, uh, transforming it and leaving traces in it. Future humanity is a regulative con uh, concept, sorry for the mistake, broader than the concept of future generation, independent of specific identity and needs, and independent of specific historical character characterization. However, it is the regulative purpose that drives the future-oriented action of those who act, and, um, who act here and now. I want to finish just citing that one that you probably know. We do not inherit the hurt from our ancestor. We borrow it from our children. And this is what I have tried to explain, introducing the notion of transgenerational social action. Thank you very much. Thank you.